Jesus is the reason for every season. Good point. And we're going to talk about that today because we're going to talk about Jesus coming, right. his triumphal entry, and Christmas and Easter all combined in one because that's what it's all about. It's all about Jesus. And he was born as a baby, and then he died for our sins and rose again. And that yep. makes it all that much better. Right. So Jesus is the reason for every season. Amen. Hi, and welcome to The Bridge. My name is Pastor Lane Jones. This is my wife, Nancy. We are excited to share with you with Nancy. We talked about in the opening, Jesus has come, and it's verifiable, and we know that absolutely. And I want to share with you that that's how we know he's going to come back. And you can be assured that Jesus is going to come and take the church, or he's going to take us one at a time, uh, the timing on that is in his hands, but we want you to be ready. So how can you absolutely know that Christ's second coming will happen? Stay tuned. We're going to get into that, and we'll be in Mark chapter 11 and verse 1 in just a moment. I might add that we are also in the transition weekend here in America. We just celebrated <clears throat> Thanksgiving on Thursday. This is Sunday, so we're we transitioning into... Christmas celebrations, right. and there's kind of a little overlap there, but I always like to make a distinction of them. And you can see the pumpkins in the background. Randy's kind of covering one. <laughs> there you go. And um, it's kind of fun to be in that transition time because Jesus is the reason for every day, not just the seasons, but every day and every minute of our lives. And this morning we had our major outreach in Lahore, Pakistan. A number of churches uh, were there, and I'll give you a full report. It's just happened, but we'll get pictures and give you more information next week on our video. Well, let's turn to the Word of God now, as Nancy will read to us. If you have your Bible, turn with us to Mark chapter 11. And we're talking about the fact that Christ came the first time as a babe. Now he's coming into the city to present himself as the Messiah, and this is the setup for the fact that he said he was coming back. Now, in coming weeks, we're going to be in the 13th chapter of Mark. And that is the dissertation of Jesus that ties Daniel and the book of Revelation together. So you don't want to miss these. These are foundational truths. And I believe Mark was the first gospel written. Matthew had access to Mark's writing when he penned Matthew. And of course, Luke did too. That's known as the Synoptic Gospels, through one eye. So join with Nancy as she begins to read. You can do it on the screen, or you can do it with your own Bible. So let's go. And I might add, he preaches out of the NIV version, and I am reading out of the NLT, which is the New Living Translation. Okay. So Mark chapter 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached <clears throat> Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany, on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it, <laughs> and we will return it soon. The disciples left and found the colt standing in the street tied outside the front door. As they were untying it, sure enough, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? They said what Jesus told them to say, and that they were permitted to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others spread leafy branches. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession and all the people around him were shouting, praise God, other translation, Hosanna. Blessings 
to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor, David. Praise God in the highest heavens. Jesus came to Jerusalem and went into the temple. After looking around carefully at everyone, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. So now Jesus is doing this intentionally, presenting himself as the Messiah, the one prophesied in the Old Testament, who would ride into the city and would be part of this celebration where they said Hosanna, which means blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Jesus may have discussed this with the people. We don't know all the details, but we do know that when they entered, they found this colt tied and they did just as Jesus asked them to do, that the master needed it and they released it and no one had ever ridden it before. But now Jesus is wanting to let all of Jerusalem know. And of course, Jerusalem was the hub of that part of the world and things that went on in that city echoed then throughout the culture. And Jesus was letting them know that he had come and that he was going to present himself as the final lamb sacrifice. Think of the millions of lamb sacrifice and goats and doves and oxen and uh, precursor uh, type of uh, sacrifices that happened uh, throughout the Old Testament from the time of Deuteronomy all the way up until this moment. And then Jesus is presenting himself as the Lamb of God, the final sacrifice for the removal of our sin. So yeah. join with me and say Hosanna. Hosanna. And we rejoice in the Lord. And this is how we know it was prophesied and Jesus did come and he was born. We're celebrating that. This is the advent, the coming of the Lord. Now, this is the coming forward of the Lord into Jerusalem as the Messiah. And because of this and what we'll learn in chapter 13, we absolutely know for sure that Jesus is coming back to take his church Amen. home. Amen. So read the next section, 12 through 21. Jesus curses the fig tree. I love figs. Just a side note there. Yeah. <laughs> the next morning, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf, a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. Then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. Hmm. And the disciples heard him say it. Then, when they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. This is the second cleansing of the temple. Go ahead. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, Scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priest and teachers of the religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because of the people were so amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and the disciples left the city. The next morning, they passed by the fig tree he had cursed. The disciples noticed it, and it was withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree you cursed has withered and died. So typically, Jesus was hungry, as a, any human would be. He was fully God, fully man simultaneously and wanted to partake of some figs. As Nancy shared, she loves figs. And, and I you... might add, where I used to run, when we lived in Hemet, there was a fig tree, and the people let me pick the figs when they were in season. And let me tell you, those figs do give you energy because yeah. they're full of natural sugar. They are. And so he looks and finds that there's no fruit coming from it. Now the parallel here is that the people of Israel were not producing fruit in keeping with the 
teachings of the Old Testament. And so there's two things happening here. One is the physical part of the cursing of the tree. And when they come out, they see that it is actually died. Well, spiritually, uh, the Jewish community was going through a metamorphosis and they were going to die under the old covenant. And notice that when Jesus breathed his last on the cross, it said a great earthquake came and it tore the curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies. It ripped it in two and gave access for all of us to God. So really, that's the spiritual significance of this, is that there is a rebirth. That's what John 3 is about. John 3 is that you must be born again. It's not, listen carefully, it's not biblical to be religious. What's right is to be in relationship with our Heavenly Father through the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. And notice that he then immediately in this paragraph, he begins to turn the tables over because he doesn't like what's going on in the synagogue, that they have turned it into making money off of the people and it's just abuse. And he turns the money tables over and drives out all those that are taking advantage of people and wants his house, his place to be a place of prayer. And just as he cleans the temple, and we're seeing that right now, just in this last year, we've seen seven or eight huge ministries in America go through some real accountability. And what does the Bible say about revival that I believe is happening now is that judgment starts at the house of God. So let us, Nancy and I, along with you, let us welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit to come upon us and to purify our actions and our motives. The church is not a business. It's a ministry. It's giving out. Jesus said, I've come to serve, not be served. And I hope that you see that. I, I don't see a pastor as being one who's driving and mandating. A true pastor is one who's in the trenches with the people and pulling. Jesus said his yoke was easy and his burdens are light. Well, a yoke is what you would hook an oxen or another animal to, to pull together. And the pastor, along with the people, should be pulling in the same direction as guided by the Holy Spirit. So, Nancy, as we purify ourselves, read now, if you would, verses 22 through 25. is a smaller passage of Scripture, but it's this development or processing of our faith. Okay. Then... Jesus said to the disciples, <clears throat> Have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you have received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that the Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Notice that this is developing faith. So when you accept Christ, he comes into our heart. The seed of the gospel is in us. Then we begin to water that seed with prayer and we feed it the word of God. That's the spiritual nourishment that comes and then we begin to grow into the person, the oak tree that God wants us to be with deep roots and strong so that when the wind comes, we are not blown away. So sea faith has a seed and everybody's given the same amount of the seed, but it's how we begin to nurture that. And as the tree, which is our spiritual life grows, then God, who's the gardener comes and he prunes things out of our lives. Just like the fig tree, you want it to grow and you want it to produce. And you don't want to have a bunch of little tiny figs. You want, want to have some nice sized figs. So sometimes they do what's called thinning, where you take some parts of the fruit when they're real little and you knock it off with your fingers and it lets more of the nutrients that are coming up through the plant, through photosynthesis into the into the plant itself, 
and then you begin to develop into a mature mother, a mature father, a grandparent. We're in the last 10 years have learned and are still learning to be grandparents, which is a real different role than being the primary parent. And it's, it's a wonderful a, role. Yeah. And uh, we, we're we enjoying that. And we want to, what, let the Lord come into our hearts and then flow, you know, out of us into the hearts of our grown children and our grandchildren. At this level, we don't tell our grown children what to do or not to do. We're not helicopter parents where you hover over everything that they do. You give them biblical principles and let them have freedom. See, everybody's really seeking freedom. And I'm thankful that here in America, we have made some way better choices in our leadership recently and uh, in our Senate, in our Congress, in the executive branch, which will follow in with judges and governors and mayors and on down. And, and even in the church, as I alluded to earlier, the Lord is purifying his church. And when sin happens, then what do we do? We share it openly. Jesus, when he helped the woman who was uh, brought before him that was caught in adultery, he didn't let them stone her or hurt her. He began to share what their sins were, and they walked away. And then Jesus asked the wonderful question, where are your accusers? And she says, there are none. And Jesus said, neither do I accuse you. But listen to the very ending of this. Now go and sin no more. That's what made David special in the Old Testament and the New Testament. He sets the, the bar for worship because he's very passionate about it. And if you've lost your passion for God, I want to encourage you to rekindle that, just like you would with your spouse, or if you've had a bump with a grown child or a small child. You, What do we do? We need to have life after the difficulty, which is part of the process. So we let the Lord come and prune out, I don't have to have my way. I can let God have his way in my child. We can't, men, we can't live our sports uh, ideas through our children. And wives, you can't, uh, mothers, you can't live your expectations of what you missed out on through your daughter. Let them experience true freedom themselves. Let them decide what kinds of things, activities, what things that they want to. Now, you steer it absolutely and give them options you know let them know if you go down this path this is what may happen but let them ask you those questions and that's why it takes quantity of time not to have quality of time you can't just sit down with a kid and in 20 seconds you can give them the right information but they're not absorbing that but if you grandmas if you have a and grandpas if you have a tea party with your grandchild they'll be listening to you and they will naturally begin to mimic what it is that you say and do. I remember one time with our grown kids, one of them did something <clears throat> and I went, wow, that's exactly how I do that. And they go, we know. And I was like, I don't remember teaching you that. And they yeah. said, you didn't. We just saw you do that for 18, 19 years. And exactly. so that's what we do. So you can't minimize quantity, right? You gotta have quantity. And that will produce good quality. That's why as our grandkids have been birthed and are growing and are small, all uh, under, under the age of nine and a half and younger, is the reason we go and spend lots of time with them. I take the boys fishing, the girls too. Nancy takes them and plays hide and go seek with them. Uh, we have all kinds of fun games and activities. And it's in that relationship and in that modeling that then we kind of hone their skills on how to treat others and forgive one another. And we don't have to win at every card game or every little sit down time. We can let others win and celebrate their winning. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here with the disciples is he's trying to teach them how to have community. That's the reason that God called Moses to the mountain to give him the Ten Commandments. The last half of the t Ten Commandments is all about community, how we get along with each other. 
And I hope that because the pendulum has shifted and wokeness is being removed from our culture, those that just want to change everything and that uh, all people are people and that there's no difference between man and woman, there are differences. And we should celebrate the differences. Men need women, women need men. And when we build those relationships built on the Ten Commandments, upon the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus teaches so clearly, when we do that, we then live healthy lives and we then impact one another in the right way. Now, notice that he talks about having faith that can move mountains. I remember as a young man learning to ask the Lord to heal my sore throat, to take away a fever. And those are early developments of healing, right, Nance? Mm -hmm. And then when you season through life and then you maybe get challenged with something like cancer or you get challenged with some kind of difficulty that, boy, really does kind of rock your world, you've been growing, pruning, developing, processing, maturing, and then you're able to handle the onslaughts and the challenges. I think the longer we live, the more we've seen and the more we are concerned. Now, if you let fear come in, fear kills faith. Let's dialogue about this and jump in, Nancy, if you would. It's one thing to be concerned about America, to be concerned about the public schools, to be concerned about maybe spiritual wobbling of grown children or grandchildren, not sure where they are spiritually. But we don't fear that. That may have been perhaps what got Job worked up was that he knew in chapter one of the book of Job, he knew that his kids had had a party. He knew that they may have uh, done some things that they shouldn't do. And he always tried to go in and offer sacrifice and, and get them to repent and make sure that they were where they needed to be. Because in the Old Testament, when you died, you went to paradise, to a holding place. And so Jesus goes there and rescues us from paradise and now to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord. So any thoughts about that, how to develop faith, Nancy, in our hearts so that we're uh, having faith that's not fearful, but that has development to it? Well, I'll add with my um, past of personal training, it's like muscles and faith is like a muscle. Great point. You you can't just go into the gym and lift 150 pounds. You have to work up to that and you have to work through the soreness. You have to work through, you have to have time to grow and develop the muscles, to let them rest. You have to feed the muscles. Then you go back and do it again and, and you build on that. And so it's kind of the same with our faith. We have to build on it. Like you were saying, it's it's a process and you have to build it. Mm -hmm. and And that takes time. And as a trainer, when you're working out and you're challenging your muscles by doing three sets of 15, what's happening to the muscle? It's ripping. It's ripping and tearing. And then that causes it to get bigger because it's like this. And then as it rips, the muscle gets bigger. And that's kind of like our spiritual lives, right? Mm -hmm. We go through, you know, sickness or financial or relationship and it kind of rips us and it hurts us. But it's Not actually, easy. It's but it's actually making us stronger. Yeah. But how am I going to believe God to, you know, touch some significant heart challenge, a, a severe breathing episode, a cancer problem, if we can't ask the Lord to heal us of a cold? That probably would work itself out naturally over the period of whatever a week or ten days. But learning to ask the Lord and asking Him to heal us. And us doing our part, eating right, sleeping right, you know, doing things we should do, but trusting him and believing him. And I think there again is the process. Now, let's add one more dynamic to that, and that's in prayer, we have to watch our motives. Now, I hope you grab a hold of this because I've learned not to tell God how to answer the prayer. I reason with God. Lord, you see this relationship challenge. You know why this is occurring. And 
I don't, but I'm asking you to come and work first in me, work in the situation, and bring about your glory in and through all that are involved. Because sometimes when we start trying to tell God how to do it, our words actually hinder the prayer and hinder what God is doing. So when something difficult is happening, what is the purpose in that? Here's the scripture. Do not grow weary in well-doing, for after a while you'll reap a harvest of great joy. Sometimes we're in that while moment, aren't we? And we don't know if that's two hours, two days, two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years. I waited 17 years for my neighbor across the street to come to the Lord. Just kept watering and praying, and we can do that. That's where we then experience the power of forgiveness. Isn't that what Christianity is all about, is forgiveness? And sin falls into two categories. One is sins that we commit. Now, maybe you're like us. We have walked with God long enough. We know what's required of, of us. So we don't overtly commit a lot of external sins. But the one that we often can get entrapped in is the sin of omission. What is it that God's asking of us? And as we're in the last month of 24, and we are right now, would you pray for us? We'll pray for you. We're laying out our general plans for 25. And we want to do the God thing, not the man thing. And there are good things that we do. But what is it that God is asking you to do, to be a part of? How can we pray for you and you pray for us? How can we team together to fulfill the Great Commission? So now Nancy's going to read verses 27 through 33 as we wrap up today. The authority of Jesus challenged. Again, they entered Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking through the temple area, the leading priest, the teachers of the religious law, and the elders came up to him. They demanded, By what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right to do them? I'll tell you what authority I do these things if you answer one question, Jesus replied. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven? Or was it merely human? Answer me. They talked it over amongst themselves. If we say it's from heaven, he will ask why we didn't believe John. But do we dare say it was merely human? For they were afraid of what the people would do because everyone believed that John was a prophet. So they finally replied, we don't know. And Jesus responded, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. So he wasn't going to buy and fall into the trap. And learn when people ask you questions, especially around this Christmas season, learn to ask deeper central questions rather than letting them lead you down a rabbit's trail that's got a hook on the end of it that really won't help anybody. So what is the authority? The authority is challenged and we then allow ourselves to what? Align ourselves with truth. Here's something to hang on to. The truth always wins in this life and for sure in the life to come. And it sets you free. It does. So we're seeing now uh, Hamas is backing down because they've lost their authority in their leadership. Uh, Hezbollah has been decimated. Uh, Iran knows that uh, there's a new sheriff in town that's the president of the United States. And when you know that somebody very capable is coming, you typically will align. I remember Nancy saying to the kids a uh, uh, half hour, hour before I got home, Dad's coming home from work. And uh, let's get the Legos and the house picked up. And they knew that I loved them, but they also knew that there was a certain expectation. That's true authority. The trick with authority is, though, you can't overuse it. 
and you can't mandate it. Authority is something to be earned. It's to be modeled and lived out. Jesus lived out authority. How? By being obedient to the Father. Mm -hmm. And his obedience to God, he expected the disciples to be obedient to him as he chose them to be a part of that. And so Jesus is not going to get tangled up. And let's not get tangled up in the nuances of political differences. But let's also not be quiet because the last 25 years or so, up until more recently, the church has found its voice. It's time to bring back, and ladies, in the area of you becoming pregnant and, and bearing the child, you did not do that alone. My body, my choice. What about whoever impregnated you, which should be a husband? If it's other reasons, you got to weigh all that into consideration. I understand that, but there's still a life. And my position on that is even if it's rape or incest, it's still a life. And if the Lord releases you from raising that child, there's many wonderful couples that would raise. But to take the life of an innocent child is just not godly and it's not right. God gives life and then God takes life away on either end of the spectrum. And the same thing with moral issues. And I'm glad to see that there's a definite standard being set now. And there is men, there, there are women, and biological men and biological women, you can never change the biology. Oh, you can do surgeries and you can, DNA. you can do makeup and hair and you can do a lot of things. But a man will always be a man and a woman will always be a woman. Truth always stands. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for the chance to have been together today to be in your word. Thank you for teaching us, Jesus, these wonderful truths. Thank you, that Jesus, that you came as a child and we absolutely without a doubt, know that you were here and that you left and that you said you were coming back. And on the facts of you being here and going into Jerusalem and giving your life, we are absolutely certain that you're coming back either individually to take us home as you have over the last millenniums or we know that at one point you will come and take the whole church, the entire body of Christ, to heaven to be with you. Help us to be ready for that. Help this ministry as we did this morning in our crusade, as we will tonight in our service with the Bridge Church. We're kicking off December 1st with Jesus, the coming King. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for watching the Bridge today. We'll see you next time on the Bridge. Thank you for joining us today on the Bridge. Please check out our website at www.thebridgeministry.online. Also, like us on your favorite social media platform. And if you're on YouTube, be sure and like and subscribe. Thank you and have a great week.